You know, last year on Mother's Day, we gave away a book on prayer. It was written by Sheila Walsh, I think, and it was a book about prayer. And this year on Mother's Day, we're going to talk about prayer. I've observed through the years that I've, uh, I've encountered a lot of people who know the Bible, but yet in spite of a knowledge of the Bible, seem to lack a depth in their life that betrays a shallow relationship with Christ. However, I've never met anyone in all my years who was a person who obviously was devoted to prayer and had a vigorous, consistent, faithful prayer life that wasn't a person of depth. E. Stanley Jones, the great Methodist missionary from the 19th or the 20th century, rather, said that prayer, and I love this definition of Jones, he says, prayer is a timed exposure of the soul to God. Now, these days, we don't really know what photographic negatives are because we've done away. Did you see it wasn't at Eastman Kodak that went bankrupt, re bankrupt recently? Because nobody's buying film anymore. It's all electronic. But we know that it used to be that photographs were made on a, 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 a light image, made a, an imprint on a piece of film. And that, especially early on, it took a period of time for that light to imprint itself on the negative, especially when there were glass plate negatives in the old days. And Jones says that prayer is exposing ourselves to God in that way, and so the image of God is imprinted upon us in the life of prayer, and we become more like Him. I think that's the reason people of prayer betray a depth of a relationship with God that's hard to deny. But at the same time, why do most people find it hard to pray? What about you? You find it hard to pray? When you pray, does your mind wander after just a few words? Many times do you, are you at a loss as to what to say and you're uncomfortable with the silence? Married couples, do most Christian couples have a good prayer life together? I would submit to you that husbands and wives as believers that your most important prayer partner should be your spouse. Is God... satisfied with your prayer life? Are you satisfied with your prayer life? I've really never met anybody who was conscientious spiritually who was satisfied with their prayer life. Why is prayer, meetings that are called specifically for prayer in the typical church, those are the least attended meetings of the church? Why is that? Why is it that if we have food, we have more people than when we have prayer? Does that betray something about us? That we need to have the courage to confront. Well, is there anybody here who would like to improve your prayer life? I see a few hands. Well, I this morning would like to share with you what has helped me. My prayer life is nothing like what it should be or what I would like it to be, much less what God would expect it to be. But I would like to share with you what has helped me, and I'd like to share this morning what I'll call my theology of prayer. You know, a theology is a perspective from the Bible on a truth about God. 
And I'd like to share with you my theology of prayer in this series. There's an app for that, and we're taking that off of the uh, applications that you have on computers, especially tablet computers these days that are all the rage where there are applications that do everything for you and you just observe it. And the title of this series is, is there's an app for that because for these weeks I'm going to be dealing with issues that are in this same vein, issues of common practice in the life of the church that come up on a regular basis and struggles that I've had with that and how God has helped me work through that and I want to share with you things that God has blessed with which God has blessed me in the hope that it will bless you. So the title today is Why I Pray, and we're going to begin with the first question, what is prayer? What is prayer? You know, Jesus in Luke 11, when he taught the disciples to pray, he began by saying, when you pray, say. So the first assumption is, is that prayer is in some way speaking with God. It's a conversation with God. When you pray, Jesus said, say. That assumes a conversation with God. It can be verbal and audible. It can be silent and mental. There are examples both of both in the Scripture. But prayer is talking to God. But to answer the question, what is prayer, and to go beyond that, what it is, is it at a deeper level? What is it in its essence? Well, I think that's most easily answered by answering this question. When in your life have your prayers been the most fervent? When are you the most likely to pray? When do you take the initiative on your own to pray without having to be challenged or encouraged or scolded? Well, I can tell you when. I don't even have to know your story. I don't even have to interview you. I can tell you exactly when you are the most prayerful. When, you, when your neck is in a noose, you don't have to be told to pray. When your back is against the wall, when you go to the doctor and you get that scary diagnosis, when you don't think things are working out the way you had hoped on the job, when relationships in your home maybe aren't what you had hoped them to be, when things, when your life gets out of your control, then on your own you are motivated to pray. And I would suggest to you that that by default tells us what prayer is in its essence as we talk to God is that prayer, I believe, is the most visible expression of a person who is dependent on God. Prayer is the expression of dependency upon God. Prayer is saying, I am not in control of my life. God, you are bigger than me, and you are the one with the final say with regard to my life. And I don't have control, you do. And prayer is an expression of dependence upon God. And I think that also answers the question, by the way, and anybody who's been around church very long, especially those who have been in some sort of pastoral ministry, know that typically prayer meetings are more frequently attended by women rather than men. That's because men are even less likely to acknowledge their dependence on anyone else, God or anyone else. I mean, just look at the whole thing of asking for directions. Who's more likely to ask for directions when you're lost? Huh? I mean, you've got to be absolutely in Antarctica somewhere in a black hole before a man will ever ask, where am I? That's because of hard-headed, independent spirit. And it manifests itself even in a prayer life. Now, prayer is talking to God. It's an expression of dependence on God. But further, we see that Jesus commanded his followers to pray. He said, when you pray. Why did Jesus command his followers to pray? You know, Paul also commanded us to pray. In fact, Paul said in Thessalonians that we're to pray without ceasing. 
What, what Paul was saying was that we always need to leave the receiver off the hook with God. There needs to be an open channel of communication. And in the spirit of today's um, technology and habits, I guess what it means is the cell phone is always on, and even though you're doing 20 other things and something else is happening, you're texting with God as life goes on. Because that's exactly what the majority of the world is doing today as everything else happens. So why did Jesus command us to pray? Paul commanded us to pray. Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, now get ready to thumb through your Bible today. I'm just putting the Scripture references on the back of your bulletin, not the Scriptures themselves. But today, Genesis 1, verse 28 it said, then God blessed them and God said to them, this is after God created man and woman, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice God created Adam and Eve, man and woman, and he said, you are to have dominion over the earth. God left Adam in charge. And Adam, in turn, we find out in chapter 3, turned the keys over to the devil. God left Adam in charge of this world, and he turned the keys over to the devil. So we see that he's even referred to the devil as the ruler of this world in the New Testament. However, we go to the book of Hebrews. If we turn to Hebrews... Chapter 2, and if you can't find all these fast enough, don't worry about it. They're listed. You're writing them down, and you can look afterward this afternoon at these scriptures. In 2.14 of Hebrews, the Bible says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil." Jesus Christ, through his death on the cross, destroyed the power of the devil. He destroyed the devil's power over this earth and the people of this earth. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, we shouldn't even have to look this one up, we ought to have it memorized. In Matthew 28, 18, then after the resurrection, he was crucified, he rose again, over 40 days appeared to his disciples. And during that time, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So Adam turned the keys over to the devil, but Jesus came and bought them back at the cross. And bought them back at the cross. And Paul even refers to him in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as the last Adam. Jesus Christ, the last Adam. He now has reclaimed dominion, not only in heaven, but in earth. So he said in John 16, 23 and 24... John 16, 23 and 24, Jesus said to his disciples before he went to the cross, he said in that day, talking about the day after his resurrection, if the Holy Spirit has come, he says, in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive that your joy will be full. You see, we see later we'll examine exactly what this means, but when Jesus says to ask in my name, it doesn't mean just a word tacked on to the end of a prayer. He's saying based on who I am and the authority that I have, you ask the Father and He will answer. And you see, he has recovered dominion as the last Adam, and he now exercises rule over this earth through the prayers of his people. 
That's why Jesus commanded us to pray, because that is the means by which the Lord Jesus has appointed that He is exercising His authority over this earth in the order that God created and intended for dominion to be exercised over the earth as the last Adam, and He allows us to participate through prayer. Now, why do we need to pray? Why do we need to pray? Well, go to Genesis 25. Genesis 25. When I discovered these truths from God's Word, it really just put a boost in my prayer life. Genesis 25. And we're going to look at verses 20 and 21. Now, background. Abraham was the man of God who believed God through whom God brought salvation to the world through his people Israel as descendants of Abraham. And then through Isaac, Abraham's child Isaac, the child of promise. So Isaac was Abraham's child of promise with Sarah that God had ordained was the one through whom the promises will be fulfilled and ultimately Jesus was born to bring salvation to the world. Now... Sarah, Abraham's wife, was barren. Therefore, her conception was supernaturally, supernaturally given by God as God worked to heal and to bring her conception and to have a child. So then we get to Isaac, their child who was born, and he was 40 years old when he took Rebekah as a wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Now, this is a fascinating passage and a great teaching on prayer. Why? Because God had sovereignly promised that Abraham would be the father of many nations through him, all the world would be blessed. And it's through Isaac his descendants would be blessed. And now Isaac is married and his wife cannot conceive. But yet God had made a unilateral, unconditional promise that Abraham would have descendants. And yet Isaac's wife is barren. His first child is born and she's barren. So what had to happen? Isaac pleaded with God. God had made a promise, but in order for that promise to be fulfilled, God's people had to pray it to fulfillment. God's people had to pray it to fulfillment. This Bible is full of promises, and God is waiting for you to pray them to be fulfilled. You see... The Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, talking about us. The Bible says that in that chapter, in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God saved us, not by any effort of our own, but by the work of Jesus. And as we trust Him and rely on Him, His right standing with God, His righteousness, His forgiveness, all of that is granted to us in a relationship with God. And in that new life, God has a life for us that we never knew before. God has a plan for us. God has works for us to do, just like Isaac had a work that God wanted him to do. And if you don't pray, you won't realize those good works that God intended for you. That's how that passage is fulfilled as we pray God to fulfill his promise in our life just as Isaac did. And then one of my favorite passages on prayer, Revelation. Revelation, chapter 8. I love this. When he opened the seventh seal, verse 1, there was silence in heaven 
for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. Okay, this is the scene in heaven that John is seeing at the throne of God. And an angel is given a golden censer. And he's standing at the altar before God, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth, and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and earthquake. Notice that the prayers of God's people, what is incense? Anybody ever smell incense? It, it's, it's, is, it a, is it a putrid uh, sort of repulsive smell? Pungent? But isn't it aromatic? The purpose of incense is to provide a pleasant aroma, is it not? Notice that the prayers of the saints, saints are anybody, the word saint is an unfortunate translation. It means hoi agioi. That's what it is in the Greek. It means the holy ones. And in the Bible, that refers to anybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ. Anybody. And the prayers of God's people are a sweet aroma before His throne. God is pleased with the prayers of His people. And they are collected before the throne of God. And notice what precipitates the power of God, lightning, earthquake, on the earth. The power of God is released on the earth after the prayers have ascended before the throne. It is our prayers that release the power and the promises of God on this earth. Now, why do, why do we need to pray? <laughs> because God works through the prayers of His people. John Wesley, the great preacher from England, understood this back in the 1700s. He said, God never does anything on the earth unless He first calls someone to pray it to happen. I like to put it this way. When God's people pray, good things are on the way. <laughs> and then, look at Mark 1. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Speaking of Jesus, the Bible says, Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Jesus went away to pray early in the morning by himself. And then look at Luke 11. Look at Luke 11. The Bible says, Now it came to pass as he, Jesus, was praying, as he was praying in a certain place, that when he ceased, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. What does this teach us? Jesus prayed. Jesus' life was characterized by prayer. Luke points that out more than any other writer of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. At every critical moment in Jesus' life, he was praying. Now, let me ask you this. If Jesus needed to pray, if Jesus needed to pray, you finish it. That's a rhetorical question. The Bible says that when Jesus selected 12 of his disciples to be named apostles, you know, Peter, John, James, and all the rest, that before he did that, he spent the whole night praying, all night long, never even went to bed. He's the sinless Son of God. If Jesus needed to pray, Why would we think we wouldn't? <laughs> and then what's the most effective way to pray? I'll tell you what's helped me. Let's look at Nehemiah. By the way, you see how we're all over the Bible here? You know, that, you've heard that story, haven't you? The shortest man in the Bible? Nehemiah. 
I just want to make sure you're awake. Nehemiah 1. <clears throat> the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down, and Nehemiah is praying about it. His first response is to pray when he hears of this. And look at what Nehemiah says to God in verse 8. His prayer is recorded here. Remember, I pray, the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now, what's Nehemiah doing? He is quoting Moses, God's word to Moses. Nehemiah is quoting God's promise back to him. Nehemiah is praying the promise of God to God, saying, God, you promised. And this is what you, as if God's got amnesia. Here's what you promised. You got to do it. Because you promised, I believe it. It's going to happen. And then, listen to these words of this prayer. Listen to these words of this prayer. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a prayer, isn't it? It's a question. Who prayed that prayer? I didn't read from the New Testament. I read that out of the book of Psalms. That's Psalms 22, verse 1. That was David praying that prayer. It wasn't Jesus. And look at, look at Psalm 31. Listen to this prayer from Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. Hmm. David wrote that psalm. Who do you remember praying that prayer? Hello? Jesus prayed the Scripture from the cross. Hello? If Jesus prayed the Word, Nehemiah prayed the Word, you think it would be powerful if you prayed the Word? John 15, verse 7. John 15, verse 7. You ought to have it memorized. Jesus said, If you abide in me, that's what it means to be born again, to be in Christ, Christ in us, us in Christ. If you abide in me, and then he says, And my words, where do we get Jesus' words? Right here. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you will ask what you will and it will be done for you. Hallelujah. Jesus not only prayed the word, Nehemiah and God's people prayed the word, but Jesus taught us to pray the word. Why is that true? Because faith is the key to seeing God hear and answer. And faith comes by hearing, Romans 10, 17, and hearing by the Word of God. You cannot have faith without this book, a faith that pleases God. Faith is believing what God has said. Abraham was a man of faith. God told him, he believed it, he did it. Noah was a man of faith. God told him, he believed it, he did it. It was all a response to what God said. That's what faith is. And how powerful. We don't know what to pray. What if you just pray the Bible right back to God? Doesn't that help you pray? <laughs> and by the way, don't you know it's consistent with the will of God? Because it's what God said. You see, that's the reason in applying this, there's a scripture you don't have on your notes. It's Romans 8, 26. It's a great promise that I claim. When I am confused about something and confronted with an obstacle for an individual or for myself or any problem in life, the first thing I pray is Romans 8, 26. The Bible says that we don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans and utterances beyond comprehension. 
The Holy Spirit is there to help us pray. And so what I ask the Holy Spirit to do, Lord, give me a promise from your word that you, that relates to what you want to do in this situation so that I can claim it before you for this and pray with faith and confidence. I just recently, I had a prayer for a family member, an issue, and, and, and I prayed, Lord, give me a promise. And it wasn't hardly any time that right to my mind came a wonderful promise from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. And that was exactly what that family member needed, exactly what they needed. And for days after that, every time I would have anxiety and they would come to my mind, I'd be concerned about their situation, I'd just bring that prayer, I'd bring that verse, Lord... I'm praying 2 Timothy 1.7. I pray it on them, Lord. And the fear and anxiety left and the faith came and a stand in victory. Now, how can we know God hears? I've got to hurry to get done here. Pastor Chris, I've got to get up earlier in the second service. Y'all got to sing fast. How can we know God hears? You know... There's immediate answers to prayer. There are gradual answers to prayer. Sometimes I pray for things and almost immediately God answers. Sometimes I pray and I'll start to see answers gradually. I'll start to see changes begin to happen. And sometimes there are what I will call pending answers to prayer. What I mean by pending is I'm yet to see. There are some things I've been praying for for 30 years. Some things I pray for for one day and they get answered. Some things I pray for for 30 years, I'm still waiting for an answer. But I'm still praying. Why? Did Jesus say in Luke 18.1, that's another scripture you don't have down there. Luke 18.1, he told them a parable that they should always pray and not give up. They should always pray and not lose heart. <laughs> I love that great George Mueller line, one of the greatest men of faith that ever walked the earth. And George Mueller was 90-some years old when he died, and he had answers to prayer that were incredible, New Testament miracles. And somebody said, have you ever had a prayer that wasn't answered? He said, well, i got two. He said, I've got two men that I've been praying for for 40 years to come to faith in Jesus, and neither one of them have come to faith in Jesus yet. But he said, I'm expecting them to come any day now. Mueller died.